Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the post-lunch coma. I'm going to start by doing a brief jazzercise exercise. Um, I've been practicing this for hours. It can kind of go both ways. The post-lunch crowd doesn't care what you say because they're sleeping or whatever. So we're just going to do the best we can. But I'm going to go ahead and just jump in. My name is Mark Fordham. I am a vice president of customer success and account management at a company called PGI, which you've probably never heard of. Um, but we have a number of different product lines that I manage in that capacity. And today, I'm just going to try to share a couple of nuggets of experience, mistakes, and, and successes that we've made in our organizations on how to best leverage customers' um, feedback, um, primarily through the conduit of the CSM, but not exclusively to help inform company-wide change. So there's a, a mug shot of me. It's actually the blown up size of it. It's horrible looking, so I'm never going to use that again. Wonderful. But I've been with the company for about eight years now. Started out with a startup company called Central Desktop in 2010. We were since acquired by the larger PGI in 2014. And PGI, just for what it's worth, I'm not going to try to sell you too hard on what we do, but it's about a half a billion dollar global provider collaboration solutions. That's audio conferencing, web conferencing, webcasting, online project management tools, and so forth. And then those two little brand guys down there are the two units that I manage as well. Um, what I wanted to kind of walk through today, um, and I'll just kind of run through sort of what I hope to work through is just very briefly, you did not come here to learn more about me. You came to hopefully gain some insight. I hope to do that. But just touch very briefly on my CS journey, um, share my own personal ponderings um, with regards to the voice of the customer. Uh, from my perspective, it can mean a ton of different things, so try to hone in a little bit there. Um, I'll share with you an example of how I've seen it work um, through a ton of trial and error, um, and hopefully more um, success than failure. Share some positive benefits walk through a couple of other um, sort of odd observations I observed through um, that time, and then just open it up for Q&A. Sound good? Wonderful? Excellent. Let's do it. All right, so my CS journey. Uh, I started out 20 years ago um, in a uh, box boy capacity at a local grocery chain called Ralph's, and I loved that job a lot. In fact, the larger the order, the more produce, the more coupons, the happier I was. Um, and ultimately, I ended up winning the Box Boy of the Year Championship Award there for there. I was very proud of it. Um, loved working with customers. Um, side note, and this joke could fail or it could succeed. I have no idea. But I was actually interviewed by the local news. And uh, I was super nervous. I was 17. I had a big mouth full of braces, huge bow tie, stupid looking apron. And they said, well, you know, Mark, what is the secret to your success? And I candidly was freaking out. And I said, I don't know. Cans in the bottom, eggs on top. And so from there, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Very proud of that joke back then. It doesn't really work so well these days. But I ultimately parlayed that somehow or another through a, a series of different endeavors and then found myself deeply passionate customer success guy. Love working in the software space, and that's where I've been ever since. So just real quick, I'll walk you through my journey and we'll get past all this um, gibberish. Again, started out Central Desktop, 2010, small SMB company, just trying to figure its way up into the enterprise like many companies perhaps attending here. Um, sought through a huge rapid uh, set of growth um, with a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes. Started a dedicated onboarding team, got rid of that and smoothed it out with the CSM team, built out an account management team, renewals ownership and so forth. Found its way into maturity, finally got acquired by PGI in 2014, which was obviously a very exciting moment. It was our exit, we were really proud of it. Um, and then ultimately uh, PGI, um, through its sort of global um, organization, said, well, we really like that CSM thing. Uh, how can you help us figure out how to make that come into our large organization? So did that for a couple of years. Super fun experience. Got to travel the globe. Got to figure out how to do global work, which included cultural sensitivities and language barriers and localization. So that was super fun. Um, and then ultimately in 2017, PGI acquired another company called ReadyTalk. They're out of Denver. And so asked me to do the same thing there. So that's just real quickly. That's my journey. Get all that out of the way. And let's get on to the goods. So the voice of the customer. I'm just going to share with you my own personal philosophy of what I've experienced We'll kind of keep it a little local to the CSM's orientation to this um, voice of the customer endeavor, but ultimately share with you some things that I've learned along the way. So let me get the obvious out of the way. I'm using one, the customer has a voice. Well, no, of course they do. Um, and, and obviously, what they say, um, how they feel, what their experience is, in their entire customer journey matters quite a great deal to the success of your organization. But I have a huge butt here. Actually, that sounded really funny when I said that. I don't have a huge butt. I have that kind of huge butt. Um, but ultimately, that only really, really works if you internally as an organization are aligned with the problems you want to solve, the problems you have the ability to solve, making sure that your entire organization knows what your mission in life is. And I'll use the example of iMeet Central, which is an online project management tool. We got way bigger competitors in the space than we, than we are. 
And we had to make a decision a few years ago to say, you know, we're going to focus primarily on this particular target audience. And this was the marketer of brand teams and agencies. And we said, we think we can make a difference in that particular space. And over the course of a couple of years, we ended up getting the entire company sort of rallied around that particular cause. We understood the things we needed to build. We deeply understood the customer that we were tackling. And it ultimately served as the basis for which we would um, ultimately prioritize our roadmap, steer the, the, team, the customer facing teams, and so forth. But if you don't do this, um, and you ultimately are, are confused internally as far as what your core mission is, especially with a fixed set of resources, what we have found is that you may, uh, if you listen to the customer too much and just kind of let them flood you with all sorts of inquiries, um, they may steer you away from your core mission if you depend too heavily on their voice. It sounds sort of counterintuitive. The contrary to that, though, that I found, we actually went through this whole experience year after year, is if you don't listen enough to them and you're so fixated on your core mission, they may decide to leave you, depart, and you may ultimately find yourself obsolete. So this idea that you have to internally be very aligned to your, your, the problem statements that you're trying to solve for and have the ability to solve for, that makes the intake of all that feedback from the customer, whether it be product experience or otherwise, a lot easier to act on, prioritize, and so forth. The third musing that we found was, and again, not all of this is rocket science. It may just be reminders for you, but this has helped me um, along the ways. It's not an activity. This idea that voice the customer is this program, it's owned by something, it's a set of surveys and so forth, all of which are incredibly important parts of it, um, is not quite exactly where you'd need to be. It's more of a philosophy, it's a culture. Um, what we have found was that when you only have partial participation in this rather than a voice the customer initiative um, and culture sort of transcending the entire organization, that partial participation only yields partial results. Um, and ultimately you'll find yourself overly depending upon feedback from certain pockets, letting there be louder voices and so forth, as opposed to having a more holistic approach to it. So what we learned was, this isn't an activity, this isn't a program you lift off the ground. This is an entire transformation of how we think about ourselves and our customer, which served to be really important to us. The next thing we, we learned was, and this is just probably pretty obvious, but it comes with a couple of caveats, is clearly the customer success manager. And how many of you in this room are in the CS space in some form or another? Okay. There's no doubt about it. They play an incredibly important part. They're the trusted advisor and so forth. And they're very important. But in my experience, they're not the only important part of this equation. That ultimately, um, you have to have the entire organization around you, like I've mentioned. But let me talk about where I think they are critical to the voice of the customer and what they bring to the table that is a huge differentiator. And when you go back to your organizations, and maybe you're trying to just um, overhaul your existing voice to the customer, introduce it from scratch and so forth. This is where I think the CSM role function plays a critical role and why I think um, it commands attention. The first of which is, as we know, they have context and relationship. There's no doubt about it. The better the CSM, the better the, the organization that is a matured CSM organization, uh, the more uh, they should have the respect, trust, and openness of that particular customer. Uh, in addition to that, they have the context. They understand what those pain points are. It's not enough to understand what's irritating the customer, what the experience is. It's, it's more deeply understanding what exactly their, their solutions that they're, they're looking for, the problems that they're trying to solve. The next thing, though, uh, that makes the CSM critical if they're doing voice to the customer in their day-to-day -day interactions and relationships with customers, uh, the way I've seen it work really well, and you'll have to pardon the poop emoji here, but there's sort of a poop umbrella, uh, not a poop funnel. Um, if your program is simply designed to intake a lot of the feedback whether aligned to your purpose and mission or not, or simply just taking all those, those, those pieces of information, those, those feedback mechanisms, and sharing it elsewhere and moving away, that's more just a funnel. And frankly, that makes it really hard from a volume standpoint, from a focus standpoint, and makes those conversations super hard when you pull all that data together and you go, well, what are we supposed to do with this information? There's a ton of stuff here that doesn't align and so forth, and it's, it, it stays too high level on the surface with regards to it's a feature, it's a problem, and so forth, rather than the deep solution you're trying to get towards. And uh, I, I learned that statement, I can't take claim to it from our, our lead, head of product a few years ago, is that we're supposed to be the poop umbrella. Keep the stuff that is not pertinent, relevant uh, to the core mission that we're trying to solve for um, outside of the general conversation around the voice of the customer. And lastly, and I did look up this, this latter word, and it is in fact a word, it's just less used. Um, if they're doing it right, they advocate, not administrate. These are not folks that simply shuffle a request from the customer to product and they go, ah, oh, I've done my job, wonderful. I've passed on the, the, the feedback. And let me use just a quick example of this because ReadyTalk is an acquisition that just came into PGI's fold and they're just starting their CSM journey. And it's, it's, it's to no fault of anybody's, but a CSM uh, there who's only been in that role for about six months 
came to find themselves as being extremely valid with the organization by simply saying, look, the customer canceled because they said that we didn't have this widget on the top right hand side of the screen. Rather than understanding, well, okay, so what's that button for? And what exactly are they trying to achieve? And why is the friction there? And what's their ultimate goal on that particular screen and so forth? For them, they said, look, the customer canceled. They had a product request. We didn't deliver on it. Game over. No fault of their own. But ultimately, the deeper they start to understand those customer pain points, the more they can advocate, fight, scream, bitch, moan, whatever words you want to use uh, to make a difference with that organization and internally. But let's talk a little bit about what, how important it is for this, to set the CSM for, up for success in that particular realm. First and foremost, and I'll reiterate a point I made earlier, and this was something that was so critical to at least us when we defined a place in the world that we wanted to live, uh, work, and win in the market, is ultimately you need to make sure they're super aligned to the company's market and product focus and goals. Because if they're not, or if they're unclear, or if you've made it schizophrenic for them, or if they're managing all sorts of different priorities, customer types, and so forth, um, it makes it really hard for them to know, one, the questions to ask, two, the things to matter, uh, that should matter to the organization from a priority standpoint, and ultimately delivers a pretty un un unsavory um, experience for the customer. Two, you hope that the CSM is doing a really great job of digging deep, man. If they don't have a virtual shovel in their toolkit to go deep, 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 um, it makes it pretty darn hard. I mean, in fact, um, I, you probably have heard this phrase before. The guy, I'm going to mispronounce his name, uh, Taki Ono. He was the architect of Toyota's production system. And he just said basically, and I quote, the basis of Toyota's scientific approach by repeating the word why five times, the nature of the problem as well as its solution becomes ultimately clear. And so we actually, and we have a whole intake system that I'll share with you, or share with you in a second. As part of that form they have to fill out, they actually have to answer five whys, which sounds super absurd and kind of redundant and irritating at first. But ultimately, what we have found was the quality of the request, uh, the depth and understanding of the use case and context, ultimately changed our entire life when we got into product council and understood what, are, what is happening in the market, what is keeping us from growing business, retaining business, um, or frankly, winning business. Um, so ultimately, digging deep, gaining the five whys, and you realize there's no end parentheses there. Shame on me. And then last but not least, and you heard it in the session earlier, close the loop. Um, and I'll, I'll explain to you how we've chosen to do it. Um, for better or for worse, it works for us. It may not work for you. Um, but we're really militant about closing the loop with our customer. We believe that if we ask them a question, they deserve a response, especially when it comes to feedback. And more often than not, I'd say north of 85, 90% of the time, our answer to them is, thank you, but that doesn't align to our, our, our focus and, and, and such. If we've done a really good job, we, we hope that they, we've communicated that along the way, that we've brought in good customers and so forth. But ultimately, we close the loop pretty aggressively because we believe that a customer has a right to hear back from us when we ask for their opinion on something. So let me walk you through how I've seen it work just real quickly. Ooh, I did do the animation. I was really proud of that. I was wondering if it was, oh, it was lovely. I have another one later. You guys keep an eye out for it. So here's how I've seen it work. Let's start with the basics of input. Now, input is not simply um, a portal that they can go to um, to say, well, I really dislike this widget, and I'm really irritated that um, I can't get this to attach to that, or whatever your product actually does. Input it transcends the entire organization. I'll walk you through how we, we do that. But that's anything from somebody in support looking at the tickets routinely, understanding what's underneath the actual request, looking and understanding what trends of question types or inquiries or confusions are, are amidst. And they're responsible in the support team in our organization for serving that up monthly into a product council environment. That's in the marketing teams where they're doing external research, they're talking to customers, they're attempting to gather case studies and wondering why it's hard and so forth. Um, that's the new sales team who has to come in with some convincing knowledge on why they've been losing business. Is, again, all in the context of the target market we're after. So we ask them to say, tell us why we're losing business across anything, you're going to get any kind of answer. So we start with input. We've created a recurring uh, sort of uh, set of listening posts throughout the organization. And then we have, not unlike many other organizations, this is rocket science, a product council. But more than just this product council where you get a kind of an update on roadmap and you look at the financials, perhaps, and so forth, each party is totally responsible for defending their ideas quantitatively and qualitatively. They have to explain the impact it's had on the business, positive or negative. And ultimately, that body then serves as the listening input um, structure within the organization. So then they take it, which is really great. Love getting all that input. What the heck do you do with it? 
Ultimately, you have to analyze it, okay? Like I said, you're looking at trends, you're looking at um, slicing it by segments, you're looking at uh, customer lifecycle journey, you're trying to deeply understand, are there some things that are kind of bubbling up all over the place that cause us to act, that cause us to take notice? And if we're not careful, and if we don't go all the way down to that level of detail, we will find the market leaving us, our customers leaving us, or us not fully capable of, of maximizing uh, the kind of new logo acquisition that we're after. So then, you, of course, you trend it. I mean, just as an example, at both I Meet Central and Ready Talk, what we do now, and have been for a while, is we are looking at al almost every attribute we can get our hands on that, that we think matter to our ability to close business and our ability to retain business and upsell it. So like I said, we're looking at uh, the size of the company, how long they've been with us. We're looking at uh, the cohort. So when did they sign up with us? Because we think that's pretty important based off of all the different external things we were doing at that time. Um, we're looking at ticket fatigue. We're looking at dollars that they've spent with it all, all the way across the gamut. It may sound super overwhelming at first, but ultimately once you get yourself into a structure, it kind of becomes more natural. You're like, yeah, of course, we need to look at these five things or so. And so we trend them, we understand them, and then ultimately we have to act on them. And I'll show you how we do that in a second. But ultimately, if all you did was gather the input, happy, friendly skies afoot, everyone is aware of what the challenges are, what the priorities are, and so forth, but you don't actually take it to the last level which is act on it from a roadmap perspective, adjust your service experience perspective. Sometimes the feedback is just speed in the platform, which sounds super boring, but that's an experiential problem that needs to be prioritized. Why does this page take so long to load? So even operations bear some responsibility in this as well. So here's how we do it uh, within our organization. First and foremost, we start with a company-wide request engine. It's available to every single part of the company. And there's an obligation, uh, internal or external, customer facing or not, to share uh, their own direct uh, feedback from customers, indirect feedback from their experience, research, closed loss deals, it all goes into one central place. Super easy to start with. You probably, many of you have something like that. Raise your hand if you have something in that form or another. Okay, pretty basic stuff. Um, the nature by which we cap, what we capture there, I think um, is interesting and I'll share that in just a second. We do that internal review. It all comes together um, in that product council. Uh, where we're evaluating what those key trends are and so forth, like I've talked about. Uh, one point of, 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 uh, of, of importance here is that we do provide that feedback to our customers readily, right away. We actually have a strict SLA on it. We believe that when a customer gives us feedback or some, or some internal folks give us feedback, we're, we're, it is incumbent upon that body to provide some response to it. And then last but not least, we regroup, we adjust, we iterate, we change, we evolve, we do all those things. So that as the market's doing its weird and crazy thing, because that's what markets do, segments of business, industries, and so forth, we also have to make sure that we're trying as closely as we can to align to exactly what that, what's happening there. So let's get specific. Company-wide engine. In that form, aside from all the other things you would expect, what's the customer name, how big are they, how long have they been a customer, all those kinds of things, we then have to evaluate not the actual feature request. That's the last thing we get to. Sometimes we don't even get to that at first. What's the priority of the issue? Is it a low, pro low problem we're trying to solve? Yeah, it's nice to have, work around, works reasonably well, not super important. Improvements would optimize the experience, but ultimately, not a game changer, not a huge disruptor, pretty basic. You'll, you'll may, may or may not be surprised, no, not a lot come in at low, because then they're not we're, we're generally putting them in the first place. Um, that's just something we've had to educate the team on after a while. Um, second, we look at the fit to the market. So they're in, in that form, they have to defend why they think the thing that they're asking for and or the feedback that they're getting aligns all the way back to what our mission in the whole wide world is. In our case, it's the marketer, it's the brand teams, it's the agency. And if it starts to really fray out, then they have to justify at least the correlation it'll have to that audience, even if it's for a different type of customer. Because you can make an improvement in your platform that dominates the, the focus of your particular target audience, but it can also have secondary benefits to other folks using the platform as well. And obviously, the, the definition of the, the problem and pain. The next thing we do, and this is just more an SLA uh, piece of advice for you, is that any of those incoming requests have to have some level of response from that body that's looking at those things within five days. Pro the, re the problem we are trying to solve here is that black hole phenomenon. It's like, I gave you this feedback. I have nothing armed back to go back to my customer. Um, you're putting me in a real disadvantaged spot. You're not allowing me to be a trusted advisor. So give me the goods, okay? We can have back and forth conversation about it all day long, but ultimately, that voice really matters then we have to give the person who's providing that request um, some ammunition to, to, to work through it. The third thing we do is we require that the person who submitted the request after they got the feedback, they have to get back to the customer within another five days. Again, sounds kind of, I don't know how large or small your organizations are, 
But for us, this was sort of a sweet spot. We have a team of about 50, 60 people all in, um, and this worked out really well. It kind of gives that, that customer success person sort of the opportunity to go, look, I have the information, I'll get back to you in a week or two. Customers tend to be pretty fine with that, unless it's sort of high, all hands on deck, which is a different scenario as you would expect, to totally different escalation path. And then last but not least, um, the entire product council, and we actually rotate members through, it's not this fixed team of people. We actually believe that when you only have a fixed uh, team of people that go into this mysterious room and everyone else is watching, they're not one sure what's going on out there unless you're super transparent, but also give them a chance to have some sort of occasional seat at the table. Um, gives them an opportunity to hear exactly how the business manages against these requests. But ultimately that body is then responsible for grouping, clustering, trending, prioritizing, and ultimately um, rationalizing and, and, uh, and scheduling those particular types of enhancements and or feedback to the customer. Like I said earlier, none of this is really rocket science, um, aside from the fact that if you can make it a, a company-wide sort of almost spiritual quest to understand what the customer is saying, what the market's saying, what your team members are saying, it makes a huge difference. And so I segue then into some of the positive benefits we experienced. Get your heads out of the gutter, not that kind of benefit. That's supposed to be funnier, you guys were supposed to have a little bit more than that. I don't know what your platform does, no judgment, just saying. Uh, but we found a few benefits from this, both internally and externally. First and foremost, and I, I wish I could tell you exactly what, when it happened in our organization, this moment where a good majority of our customers became aligned to what we were trying to do. And there was almost this like magical moment that took place where the customer um, had clear expectations um, laid out on what they needed and how they needed to hear it and what the response time was, and we delivered it. And the flip side of that as well is um, we were able to get close, more closely aligned to our customer. Um, they were along for the journey. They weren't confused about what we were doing. We weren't in the secret shop building stuff that was absent in vacuum as to what their needs were and the problems that we were trying to solve. Two, and boy, I'll tell you, this took our CSM team to like a completely different level. This notion that they could go back to a customer with a response, with some sort of action, with some sort of ask for clarification, but it gave them the tools and information that they needed to be that trusted advisor. It was almost like the entire company was supporting their mission in life, which was to be just that. And they walked away with a bit more swagger. It was, it was fascinating to watch. Um, third, company-wide ownership and action. Every part of our organization, and this probably took, if I'm honest, two years to, to accomplish from the moment we, we set off to do this through all the iterations to this point where our VP of web operations, who's responsible for obviously stability, security, and performance, among many other things, felt a vested ownership in reading and gathering that feedback, looking at the statistics, helping to understand where the degradation points were, correlating that to the, the key pages within the application that were slower than they should be, optimizing it. And that's one of the, I'll call it the more boring examples of it, let alone all the other parts, the goods, features, and so forth that you want your customer to have. Um, so the whole company started to speak a common language, which, again, I wish I could describe that inflection point, but it changed the way we, we looked at the business, the statistics, and so forth. Um, another one was earlier customer risk detection. This was something we weren't necessarily seeking to understand as a primary objective, but ultimately we came to find out that customers who were exhibiting certain types of feedback, both in volume, severity, and so forth, uh, for us became an earlier detection of potential risk. It was them basically saying through one survey, one trouble ticket, and so forth, that if we could aggregate it up at an account level, wow, this customer seems to be considering a journey switch uh, well before and in, in addition to any of the other uh, characteristics that make a customer more churniverse. Um, what we found was early on in the implementation, they're pounding us with feature requests. And that's just sale to you know, ongoing onboarding, that happens all the time. Then they go quiet, for, for at least from our perspective, and then those that journey, their journeys are looking like they're gonna start departing from ours, um, they're starting to bubble up quite a bit more. And we were really not looking at it necessarily at an account level as a primary objective, but boy, it changed the game for us. Now, there were instances where there was nothing we were gonna do to save them, because the customer's journey was in fact departing holistically from where we were headed and what we wanted to win at, uh, but ultimately we also found quite a number of account saves from that too. And then last but not least, just plain old better product roadmap and prioritization. Um, fact of the matter is we now, um, the last time I calculated this, I bet you nowadays we probably produce more um, valuable um, sort of value added features and improvements to the platform by like 15 to 20% than we were before. And that's nothing more than clarity, focus, stay the course, 
um, iterate and so forth. Whereas before we were in these product councils that were argumentative and disjointed and folks um, had strong opinions that were absent to the company's mission and so forth. So we just, we were able to go faster. And last but not least, maybe just a couple of other things that I observed along the way as well. And I sort of mentioned this one a second ago. Longer term customers with sustainably high level of future requests, uh, from our perspective, are foreshadowing we have a customer at risk or at a drift. Just plain and simple. Um, and to not, again, have that structure to give them feedback, align closer to them, um, understand if perhaps they're not even sure of their own journey and so forth, and be that trusted advisor, um, we found was a risk factor over and above all the other things, ticket fatigue, age of the customer, and so forth. Um, we learned that it's okay not to be afraid to let your customer know about your product market fit and aspirations, frankly to say no, or unsure, or not now, versus stringing them along. Now, when I say that out loud, actually, I hear myself saying, well, I, I'm responsible for renewals. Maybe it's better to not say anything, because <laughs> maybe we'll stretch out an extra six months of that customer. We actually didn't find that to be the case. It was very rare for us that when we were pretty overt and honest with them, um, that they weren't at least aware, understood, understanding of it, and frankly, wanted to continue to contribute because maybe they saw themselves saying, look, we consider ourselves um, an expert in our field. Um, you know, we are a ripe example of what you should be winning at. You need to listen to us more. And it kept the dialogue going, right? It wasn't just this transactional moment in time. It caused us and them to say, look, let's continue to partner and see if you're, to make sure company, Mark Ford and company, you guys are aligned to where you need to be. And last but not least, and this is something we didn't do at first. It was a mistake that we made and we've since corrected. Support and empower your CSM team to tell the customer no without fear of compensation impact or customer blowback. <coughs> Our CSMs at first were terrified to go, you know, hi customer, I uh, talked to the people over there and it's not happening. They were terrified that if they were on a variable compensation plan, if they were gonna lose the renewal, were they gonna miss out on a bonus opportunity and so forth. So we just took that completely out of the equation, um, further empowering them to close more closely align to the customer and frankly be more of a trusted advisor and advocate for them. And that's all I got to say about that topic.